All right, session number four. I guess we're only going to have four sessions today. I should be breaking it down to smaller chunks, but I get started and nobody stops me. So, All right, so we're going to finish out our section on uh, the, the canon and the, and the manuscripts here. All right, um, I'm not going to spend as much time in the Old Testament. I'll just mention a few things. All right, so here's a piece of the Psalms from the Dead Sea Scrolls. I'm sure everybody here has heard about the Dead Sea Scrolls. All right, so let's talk about the reliability of the Old Testament. You might not have heard of this thing called the Masoretic Text. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. There you go. Perfect. All right, the Masoretic Text. Uh, see, the Jews had a law that when a manuscript got old, you either buried it or burned it. So that's why we don't have a plethora, if you will, of ancient manuscripts of the Old Testament, Hebrew ones. <coughs> All right? They did not have that rule about, say, Septuagint translations, but Hebrew manuscripts, when they got old and worn out, were to be burned or buried, one or the other. And in and, and around uh, the ninth century, these, this group of of Jewish teachers and rabbis created what's called the Masoretic Text. What they did was they took the various strains of Hebrew manuscripts. There were a number of lines of Hebrew manuscripts. Remember I mentioned the, uh, the Western and the Alexandrian and the Byzantine text. There were different texts. And basically they, they brought all that together and made a single united Hebrew text we call the Masoretic Text. These people were the Masoretes. That was good and bad. Probably more bad than good. It was good in that they produced an excellent, summarized, as accurate as possible, Hebrew text in around 800 AD. But what's bad is that somewhat similar to what the Muslim scholars did, but not by killing people or burning them all, the, the ultimate result is this wide variety of, he, of Hebrew texts that might have been able to, to use to do textual criticism to decide what's the correct one. We don't have those. Okay? But then, of course, there's the Dead Sea Scrolls and there's the Septuagint. These are the things we can use to help us, uh, you know, come up with a more reliable Old Testament. Okay? Uh, in addition, not only do we have the Septuagint, and I, hopefully I explain what the Septuagint is, the Septuagint is a Greek translation of the entire Old Testament made during the 3rd century B.C. So what it is, it's a snapshot. It's a snapshot of, first of all, not only what the, the, the Hebrew Scriptures said, but what the Jewish people at the time thought it said when they translated it. For example, there's a famous one in Isaiah 7 where it says, Behold, the virgin will be with child. People say, well, that's not really virgin. You're right. The original Hebrew said, the young maiden will be with child. All right? So they'll say, that's not a prophecy of the virgin birth. Oh, yes, it is. Of course it is. And now, how do I know that? Because of the Septuagint translation? Well, not necessarily. But the fact is, the Jews, before Jesus, who had no reason to kind of go against Jesus, the Jews read that passage and said, that word should be translated as virgin. Why? Because it says, the, the young, behold, a sign, a young woman be with child. Let's imagine a young woman had sex and had a child. Would that be a sign? No. So naturally, when they translate it to the Septuagint, they said a virgin will be with child. Hello? All right, so that, that's just an example of one of the uses of the Septuagint. Every once in a while... When, you're, uh, when you read the Old Testament, you know, you kind of, the stuff in the bottom, it says, you know, all those things. It'll say Septuagint this and Masoretic that. That's what we're talking about. All right, the three main sources for the best possible Old Testament text are the Masoretic text, which was this corrected, awesomely scholarly uh, Hebrew text from about the ninth century, and the Septuagint, which is really the earliest photograph, if you will, we have of the Old Testament because it's a translation for the 3rd century B.C. and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay? Those are the main sources of creating as accurate as possible. Now, in addition, 
We also have the Samaritan Pentateuch. Now, this is only the first five books. You know the Samaritans, they only, uh, they only use the first five books. They didn't believe in the other ones. So it's only the Pentateuch, but this is a translation made 400 B.C. So not only do we have the Septuagint to help kind of maybe ask some questions about what's the most reliable early Hebrew manuscript, we also have, have the Samaritan Pentateuch. Now, our manuscripts of that Bible are not as old as the Dead Sea Scrolls, but nevertheless, once the thing gets translated, it's kind of like a, a photograph. Okay, we have the Syriac versions, and we have the quotes of the Old Testament from the Mishnah and the Talmud. Whatever those are, well, I'm moving on here. Okay, great. Now, uh, these are the oldest Old Testaments we had up until fairly recently. These are all Masoretic texts. Cairo, Aleppo, Leningrad. You can see the dates, 895, 920, 1008. And I believe the Leningrad is the entire Old Testament. Cairo and Aleppo are, are partial, but significant. Okay. Now, um, now, if you want to argue that the Old Testament could have changed significantly, you know, from, let's say, 700 B.C., when Isaiah was written, till, uh, let's say, 980, that's 1,600 years. If a book got copied and copied and copied and copied and copied and copied and copied for 1,600 years, is it reasonable to think that major changes could have come into it? The answer is yes. Okay? So uh, that, that, does that create a problem? You know, it's debatable how much of a problem, but it's not as if it creates no potential problem. All right. Now, let's talk about these Masoretes. These guys were whacked out crazy people, I'm telling you. They, were, they, they worshipped the Bible. You know, I guess that was a form of worshipping God for them, but these guys were crazy. Before starting to copy the scrolls or codices, the scribe was required by the Masoretes to go through an elaborate ceremony in order to preserve the integrity of the text. They counted all the letters of the Old Testament. Can you imagine? They kept track of such arcane details as the middle verse of the Pentateuch. And they also found the middle verse of the entire Hebrew Old Testament, Hebrew Bible. They were aware of the middle word of the whole Old Testament, the middle word of each book. They kept record of the middle letter and verse of each book. They kept record of, uh, I'm sorry, taking it through the stream, they also counted the number of times each Hebrew letter appeared in the entire, each of, of each book. Counted the number of verses which contained all the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. All this was intended to produce exact copies. <laughs> These guys were crazy. <laughs> Would this radically increase their ability to produce accurate copies, to say the least? Because they would make a new copy and they would count the number of letters. Is that if it has a different number of letters, they burn it. All right? All right, so now those 1,600 years are appearing to be not quite as huge a chasm, perhaps, as we thought. That's the Masoretes working between 500 and 1,000 A.D. But for them, we had the Talmudists. These guys were just as crazy. A synagogue, a synagogue roll must be written on the skins of clean animals, prepared for particular use by the synagogue by a Jew. They must be fastened together with strings taken from clean animals. Every skin must complain, contain a certain number of columns throughout the entire codex. The length of each column must not exceed over or less, blah, 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 blah. They had to wear certain uh, uh, clothing. They said if a king or a priest were to come into the room, ignore them. And then going on, these guys were as crazy as the Masoretes. All right, so, you know, this doesn't prove anything, I guess, but it, it's evidence that the Jews were, they were over the top, um, trying to get a perfect uh, Old Testament. But there's still those annoying 1,400 years. That refers to from about, let's say, 500 B.C. to around 900 A.D. That's, that's, that's a long time. And the Talmudists and the Masoretes only cover from about 100 A.D. to 900 A.D. There's still those annoying 1,400 years. Of course, 
Then there was the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947. You're aware of that. It's a cool story. I don't have time to tell you the story about the boy in the cave. It's a pretty cool story. This is not the cave that that boy found. This is Qumran number four, where they found more uh, manuscripts by far than Qumran one. Okay, now this, this graphic will help out. All right? So, um, here's the time between, let's say, uh, Malachi and the... A Leningrad Codex. Okay? Now, if you have the Isaiah scroll from roughly 150 to 200 BC, that's taking the, the time difference from, say, 1400 years down to 250 years. So we're covering about 80% of the time. All right? Now, let's compare Isaiah in the Dead Sea Scrolls to Isaiah in the Masoretic text. And they found something like 10 differences. None of them significant. <sighs> All right. <laughs> that helps. All right, now, I would say this. The, the Hebrew Old Testament we have is not as precise. In other words, I would make the statement that the Greek New Testament we have is almost 100% absolutely perfect. I'm not going to go that far with the Old Testament, to be honest with you. There are a significant number of copying issues. Uh, numbers are especially problematic. So if it says 700, or if it says 770 configure, I have no idea. I, I really don't know. Okay, one of the reasons is uh, the, the, the Jewish numbers were kind of like Roman numerals. They used letters instead of numbers. And some of the letters were practically the same. In other words, the, the, the letter for the number seven and the letter for the number two, for example, look almost the same. I mean, oh, my goodness, that'd be hard to copy. And, and the, the, for example, if you have a mistake in letters, for example, 437 versus 439, the context doesn't really help, you know? But like I said, H-E-L, H-I-L-L, H-E-L-L versus H. Uh, you know, whatever. If you change one letter in a word, you go, oh, mistake. Change one number, I don't know. I mean, it might be a mistake. You know, how would you know? All right, so the, the bottom line is um, our Hebrew Old Testament is not, I wouldn't go so far as to say it's virtually perfect. I, I, I think that'd be an overstatement. And remember I said we should avoid making overstatements in defending the, the faith. Okay. I, uh, like I mentioned, we've got the Separatum, Pentateuch, the Septuagint, the Aramaic Targums, the Old Syriac. This is not new information. Here's an Arab translation of the Samaritan Pentateuch, a very, very old one. Okay, uh, textual errors in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, again, like I said, if you saw A-M-E-R-I-X-A-N, you'd say, well, there you go. But if you saw 5, 10, 51, 5100, or 500, how would you really know? All right? Uh, for example, the Hebrew letters Kaleth and Resh. Look at those two letters. Oh, look at He and Heth. Oh, yeah, look at those. Sure, if you'll go forward. Yeah. All right. Uh, look at He and Heth. You know, I can see how if you're copying those, you know, I don't know. I, you know, I could see how that could get switched. And Kaleth and Resh. You know, I, you know, so the bottom line is copy errors definitely did happen. All right. Uh, nevertheless, um, I would say if we look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, we, we cross 80% of the time span from when the New Test Old Testament was complete to the oldest manuscript we had before, and we realize there's only maybe a couple of dozen changes in the entire Isaiah scroll, Isaiah text, we kind of go, well, all right, it's looking fairly good. All right, so, uh, um, let me see. Yeah, okay, I'll do that in a second. I'm going to do a summary in a bit. Uh, what about the canon? Well, what we have is the Targums, the Talmud, and the Mishnah. What are those? These are uh, Jewish writings uh, from some of them before C B.C., more of them after B.C., out in A.D. Uh, we have Josephus, who said there's not 10,000, but there's 22 books. Saying 22, I thought it was 39. No, 22. For example, the 12, you know, the, the Minor Prophets, that was one book. First and Second Chronicles, one book. Um, Ezra and Nehemiah, one book. First and Second Samuel, one book. So we, we know 
uh, from Josephus what the canon was, and he listed them. Some people have said that the Council of Jamnia in 90 AD was when the Old Testament canon was set. That is not true. You can read the proceedings of the Council of Jamnia. These were Jewish scholars getting together after the time of Christ. And they debated a couple of books. All right, uh, One of them was Song of Solomon. And the other one, I believe, was Ezekiel. And it, it's not as if they weren't already accepted in the canon. But they discussed some of the arguments. And they said, well, they're canonical. All right. All right. So uh, basically, uh, the, the, when was the Old Testament canon set? Well, if you read the Talmud, the Talmud says that Ezra finalized the Old Testament canon. So that would mean around 450, 440 BC, Ezra said, This is your canon. I don't know if that's true. But what I can say is, certainly by 250 B.C., how do I know that? Because that's when the, the Septuagint translation was made. All right? Uh, also, I believe the New Testament is inspired by God. And if you read the New Testament, it, it quotes from almost every Old Testament book. And it never, ever quotes from any other book. And again, uh, you know, Jesus, I, if Jesus says Jeremiah is inspired, I figure it's probably inspired. All right, so my confidence in the Old Testament canon is strong. Okay? And then about the Apocrypha, I'm going to skip that. I talked about that already. All right, Old Testament reliability, a summary. The canon of the Old Testament was set by a general consensus of the Jewish rabbis, perhaps as early as 300 B.C., but almost certainly by 300 B.C. The Council of Jannia more or less confirmed this list of books. Hebrew and Aramaic text of the Old Testament is remarkably close to that of the original writings. That would be my conclusion on that. All right, and then I talk here about uh, apocryphal stuff. I'm going to skip this. Shepherd of Hermas, Epistle of Barnabas. People ask questions about that, so maybe I could stop there very, very briefly. Shepherd of Hermas, Didache. Uh, the, the early church fathers said these are profitable for reading in the church, as are the books I brought with me. So buy some copies, please. I don't have to bring them home. I know you're students. You don't have any money. So I know you won't buy them, but please do. All right? Because then I don't have to carry them home with me. Okay? Nobody's bought any yet. Since you can... All right. You have till tomorrow. That's cool. All right? Uh, uh, Bar somebody asked about Barnabas. There are unfounded allegorical interpretations. And in, in other words, Barnabas is interpreting the Old Testament, and you kind of go, really? Well, I don't know about that. All right? And... and and, but uh, as I see Paul interpreting the Old Testament, I go, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, there's some things that are, pro that, like I said, uh, Epistle Barbara has some anti-Semitic comments in there that I, I kind of go, I don't know about that. So, you read these for yourself. I think you'll find that they're profitable for reading. And go ahead and read them. They're not inspired. All right. Uh, uh, inspiration in other books. Uh, I, I'm not going to go into this. We could talk about it. I've already talked about Islam, Baha'i, or Mormonism, Hinduism. There's a bunch of things we could say. The bottom line is, if you compare the evidence for the inspiration of the Bible to the evidence for the inspiration to any other scripture in the world, it's like, why, why are we even talking about this? It's kind of like comparing Jesus to, um, you know, Moses. <laughs> the, 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 you know, so I'm going to skip all this. There's the Sanaa manuscript, by the way. <laughs> that, and the, the, one, the, the one up here is the Sanaa manuscript. The Tashket manuscript is also another one that has variations from, from the um, uh, Quran that's accepted. Anyway, I'm, I'm not going to get into all this m m apologetics of Islam. That's really interesting. Hindu scriptures, Buddhist scriptures. All right, yeah, now this is important. I, want, I, I really want to spend some time here. I want to talk about inspiration and inerrancy. Does the Bible claim to be inspired? Yes. Does the Bible claim to be inerrant? Yes. I mean, doesn't, doesn't David say your words are perfect? And he does say that. I think so. All right. So, uh, so let me give a, a possible definition for inspiration. The entire Bible, although authored by men, is divinely and authoritatively the revelation of God. That would be a statement of it being inspired. 
And what we have clearly established is the Bible claims about itself that it is in fact inspired. And these are familiar passages to you, 2 Peter 1, uh, 2 Timothy 3, 1 Thessalonians 2, 2 Peter. So, uh, it's interesting because in 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16, uh, oops, oh, really? Oh, I'll have, to, I'll have to go really far. Oh, my goodness. All right. Oh, not too bad. All right, 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16, this is where Peter says Paul's writings are inspired. All right, so we know for a fact that the writers of the New Testament were aware that their writings were inspired. All right, and it's clearly, and I believe Peter's implying that his writings are inspired as well, even as he's talking about Paul's writings being inspired. All right, now, is there such a thing as an inspired opinion? That's a tricky question. Yeah. You know, in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul says, I, not the Lord. So that means it's just as an opinion? Because, see, the Lord spoke to divorce between married people who were believers. And so basically what Paul did there is he said, here's what the Lord said. Then it says, now I, not the Lord. Here's what I say about this. So is that just his opinion? Is it inspired, but it's just his opinion? All right, let me give you my response is it's inspired, and you call it his opinion or not. Either way, it's in the Bible. It's authoritative. All right? Now, are there any errors in the Bible? The Bible is full of errors. Uh-oh. Let me, let me explain what I mean. Let's go to John 9.31. Please, don't leave now, whatever you do, all right? <laughs> don't leave now. Uh, I, I did that partly to catch your attention. If you were falling asleep, you're now wide awake, probably. All right? The Bible has errors in it. So therefore, it's not inerrant. I believe the Bible has errors in it, and yet the Bible is inerrant. All right? Let me explain myself. Okay, here we go. John 9, 31. We know that God does not listen to sinners. Therefore, God does not listen to sinners, right? Who said it? it who said this? John 9, 31. Who said it? Hmm? The man born blind. He says, we know that God does not listen to sinners. Uh, well, that's not true. Right. That's an error. It's not an error. It's not an error. All right? But it, by one definition, it's an error. I mean, what he said is not true. Are, are there any people recorded in the Bible telling lies? Well, yeah. So there's an error. All right? So you have to be careful in, in what you mean when you say the Bible's inerrant. Okay, got it? Yes. But that, that, but that guy's not true. By the way, David said in Psalm 51, against you and you only have I sinned. Well, That's not true. Yeah. That is not true. Yeah. David sinned against Uriah. What do you think? Yeah. Think he might have sinned against Bathsheba and maybe his other wives. Whoops, yeah. <laughs> other wives. There's a whole problem right there. <laughs> So how do I explain that David said, against you, you only have a sin? Because it's poetry. David's like, ah! you know, he's just saying what he feels. All right? And you have to take the Bible. For example, in Proverbs, it says, raise your child the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. Well. And therefore... Let's say we have a faithful disciple in the church and their kid's not a Christian, therefore they didn't raise him the right way. Now, that's, that's a proverb. Come on, bro. That's not a promise. Mm. All right, so I believe the Bible is inspired by God. I also believe it's inerrant. But a, you know, if we do not understand what we mean when we say inerrant, if we don't define it carefully, we're going to get... We're gonna, remember I said don't paint yourself into a corner? The easiest way to paint yourself into a corner in the whole 
evidential areas in this, uh, you know, the Bible being without error thing. So you have, to, you have to be careful how you consider this, I think, pretty important topic. And for, for, uh, for this group here, I think this is quite important for you to careful, come to a careful definition here. Oops, I went forward a few on mine. All right, um, let me see here. Now, clearly, the Bible writers themselves and Jesus himself understood the Bible to be not only inspired, but inerrant. In, in Galatians 3.16, Paul makes an argument based on the fact that a word is plural, not singular. You got that? That's called verbal inspiration. Technical term. You know, because it's inspired as in, you know, God inspired it, you know, in generally, you know. But Paul interprets a particular word, not seeds, but seed. Singular, not plural. Therefore, he's talking about Jesus. All right, so clearly, I'll take your question in a second. Clearly, both Paul and Jesus, because there's examples of Jesus, interpreting something based on the tense of a verb. So clearly Jesus and Paul believed the Bible was verbally inspired, inspired at all possible levels you could analyze its inspiration. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, this is from your last point. What was the scripture you used um, about the child who, if they don't become a disciple, they... Uh, Proverbs, I, I didn't say the... 25 or something like that. Okay. Uh, t train a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. Uh, you Google it, you'll find it in three seconds. All right. And the reason that creates a problem is if you interpret a proverb as a doctrine, which you should never do, you're going to get in trouble. And then the Bible suddenly has errors every, everywhere you look. All right. So when you leave this room, please do not quote me on saying the Bible has errors. Quote me on saying the Bible's inerrant. Okay. If you're going to give the other quote, then make sure you give all the other stuff I'm adding to that when I explain what I mean by that. Okay? Again, in Luke 20, verse 37 and 38, Jesus makes an argument from the Old Testament based on the tense of a verb. Okay? So Jesus believed the entire Bible was verbally inspired which means inspired at the level even of the individual words chosen, their tense, their ending, their conjugation, and all that stuff. All right? So I think that that answers that question, at least for me. Now, what about what we read? Are translations inspired? No. No. So, have you ever read an inspired text? <laughs> the answer is, no, you haven't. Does that mean that we're in deep doo-doo or something like that? No, it's just, we have, to, we have to recognize that translations are not inspired. Why did God not produce inspired in translation? So, who's going to choose? You know, you know, he's got a, a translation into uh, I don't know um, Korean. Who's going to be the inspired trans? You know, uh, you know, God chose people. Are copyists were copyists inspired? No. So we do not have the original autograph. And besides, we're reading translations that are not inspired. Now let, let me let me say something right here. I believe that we have better access, better, did I say bad? better access to understanding both the Old and New Testament than the, than the Jews did in the time of Jesus or, and that the New Testament church did in the time of you know, the first century. Why? Because we have all the historical stuff they didn't know. We have, you know, we have thousands of scholars who study the meaning of every Greek and Hebrew word and, and they know all this historical stuff. I, I really believe that we have as good an ability to understand what Paul said to the Corinthians as the Corinthians did to understand what Paul said to the Corinthians. I mean, we have so much stuff. I mean, people reading the Bible in, I don't know, in, in uh, Cambodian or Khmer or something like that, maybe not, but here in America, I believe we have better access to understanding the original words of either the older New Testament writers than the audience themselves. 
even though we're reading translations, because we have 27 different translations. All right, so you get your, NS, your RSV and your NAS and your NIV. In between the three of them, for any Greek word, there's never any one English word that's got an exact meaning. So what the translators do, here's the Greek word. Well, I'm going to use this one. The next translator says, well, fine, well, I'm going to use that one. All right? You read, you read five or six different translations, and I'm telling you, you can get as good a sense of the original as, you know, as if you spoke the original. So, therefore, let's not worry about it, but the bottom line is it, we are reading from uninspired translations of uninspired copies of the originals which were inspired. Does that shock you? about to lose your faith? But again, if you're trying to defend the Bible, don't cover this up and pretend this is not true. That's painting yourself into a corner. All right? So, again, I'm going to back up and I'm going to say the autographs, the original written letters, histories, proverbs, etc., are inspired. Okay? Does the fact that the copies and the translations are not inspired, does it affect your faith? I say it shouldn't. It doesn't need to. Because we have these access to things, I'd say, you know, we can understand as well as the original receivers of the actual message. All right, now, how do we know the Bible's inspired? All right, now, from an evidential point of view, that's a little bit, that's an interesting question. For example, uh, uh, by the way, it's, that's random, Esther 3, 4, that's random, don't look up Esther 3, 4, that's, that's just random, that's just, I just picked that at random. Let's check that one out. That's, that's random. I don't even know what it says. So can I prove Esther 3, 4 is inspired? Well, how could I? I mean, it's just some random verse. Now, I can, I can show that, uh, that um, Psalms 23 is inspired. Check it out, you know. And, oh, man, I wish you had time to go through Daniel in this class. Oh, my goodness. Those prophecies. Whew. All right, but, you know, I, I can't prove Esther 3, 4 is inspired. I can't. The fact that uh, Peter said, I'm sorry, the fact that uh, Paul said all scripture is inspired by God, that's not evidence. That's just a statement. That's either true or not. And you can, you can check out the evidence for that. But here's what I would say. The evidence that parts of the Bible are inspired is clear and, you know, it's beyond reasonable doubt. All right? And so we already know that God inspires scripture and how much of a leap is to say that he would inspire the whole thing? How much of a logical leap is that? The answer is not much. All right, so uh, again, don't oversell the evidence, but don't undersell it either. That's my advice. All right, now this is a list of reasons I believe the Bible clearly shows evidence of inspiration. Historical reliability, fulfilled prophecy, fulfilled foreshadowing and prefigures, as we saw yesterday, uh, consistency of doctrine and theology, lack of contradiction, scientific wisdom. Jesus said it was inspired. Jesus said it was inspired, right? And then he was raised from the dead. And he raised Lazarus from the dead. He walked on water. I, that's good enough for me. <laughs> the quality of the text. I mean, if you start comparing the Bible to anything else, it's like, you know, you, you can take it deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, and you're going... I, I, how many layers of meaning is there here? And at some point, you kind of go, this is not human wisdom. <laughs> so these are reasons, I believe, that we can conclude that the whole Bible is inspired by God. All right? The preponderance of the evidence. What's the most rational conclusion? Clear. Does faith fill in the rest? Yes, it does. Otherwise, you're stuck. All right? What about inerrancy? All right, here's a statement of inerrancy. The Bible contains no errors whatsoever. All right, now that's what fundamentalists say, but, you know, I guess they, they even call them fundamentalists anymore. Whatever, never mind, that's an old word. That's what certain people from certain denominations who kind of have a n not very uh, well thought out understanding of what we mean by this. We have translation issues. We have copying issues. We need to define inerrancy a little bit more carefully than that. All right. Uh, here's, here's one person's statement. I, this is just one person's statement. Uh, the inerrancy of Scripture means that Scripture in the original manuscripts does not affirm anything that is contrary to fact. Okay? I, I, I think it doesn't affirm 
doesn't affirm anything that's contrary to fact. Remember that guy said, uh, you know, uh, um, God does not listen to sinners, you know. It doesn't affirm that. So I, I think that's a useful statement, all right, of, in, of inerrancy. Now, there's the Chicago statement. This, uh, there was a bunch of evangelicals who came together in 1978, and they were a little bit miffed by these fundamentalists who kept saying, the Bible is inspired by God, therefore the, the earth is 6,000 years old, therefore, you know, all these other things that, you know, you know therefore, um, um, uh, what did David say in Psalm 51? Yeah, uh, uh, that you can't sin against a person. It, you know, all these crazy things that you could kind of find in the Bible that aren't there at all by saying it's, you know, and therefore uh, there's going to be a thousand year reign and Jesus is going to come and live on the earth and therefore these helicopters are going to come down and, you know, Armageddon and all this kind of stuff. These people annoyed some fairly clear eyed, good sound thinking people and so they come up with this statement of inerrancy. All right, uh, which I don't have the whole thing. All right. Are the Gospels an exact transcription? In other words, when you're reading the story where Abraham is talking to Pharaoh, is that a transcript of the conversation? Probably not. So what is it then? Well, I'd say it's a faithful rendition of what was said and what happened. Okay, when you're reading the Sermon on the Mount, are those the exact words Jesus said at that particular sermon on that particular day in that exact order? Maybe. Put it this way. I believe by faith that God could do that. I mean, I, I know he could do that. I know he could give, uh, you know, Matthew perfect memory. But the problem is then you read the, the version of the Sermon on the Mount in Luke and kind of go, well, you know. You know. Uh, see, you have to understand when the New Testament writers put these things together, they were not thinking as Westerners would think. We think very linearly. So we think that if you said this happened, and then later on you said that happened, then they have to be in chronological order. Otherwise, you're wrong. But that's just not how people in the Near East thought back then. So there will be chronological errors, if you want to call them that. But we have to define an error in the terms of what would have been an error to the original writer. Okay, so these are things you might want to think about. So are the days in Genesis literal? Did Jesus clear the temple twice? My answer, by the way, is I'm not sure. I honestly don't know. But I do know that John puts that at the very beginning of his ministry. And then uh, the, the, the Synoptic Gospels put it down. My personal opinion is that Jesus cleared the temple twice. That's my personal opinion. But if it turns out that when we get to heaven and I find out that John took that event that happened near the end of Jesus' life and put it earlier on for a particular theological point he's trying to make, I wouldn't go, oh, man. You know what I'm saying? So did it happen twice or did it not? My opinion is he went into the temple twice. Okay? But... Is that is that is my belief that the Bible's inerrant based on this conclusion? I would say no, it's not, because I mean we have to have a, a definition of inerrancy that makes sense. Okay, um, are there chronological chronological errors in the New Testament? Yeah, are there chronological errors in movies we watch sometimes? Well, yeah, <laughs> that's kind of with postmodernism they do that on purpose a lot. That's kind of but that's the thing, you know. All right, uh, what about paraphrases? Do the New Testament writers ever paraphrase the Old Testament? They do. Jesus even paraphrased. Jesus says, as it is written, if you look, if you go back to the Hebrew, well, that's not exactly what they said. So does that mean the Bible has an error in it? So again, what do you mean by an error? All right. Um, I guess you only have I sinned. Now, it says that Moses was in the de desert for 40 years. What if it turns out it was 40 years in one month? Is it possible for theological reasons, there's actually 37 that was rounded to 40 to make a theological point? I think it is. 
I'm, I'm not saying it was 37 years. I'm not saying it was 46 years. What I'm saying is, if it turns out, at the end of time, we find out it was actually 41 and a half years, and it was rounded to 40 be, to make a theological point, because the points to the Hebrews were theological anyway, I go, all right, fine. <laughs> So let's not stake our belief in the inspiration of the Bible or in the errancy of the Bible on things that are not really that important. So uh, we should be cautious about imposing modern Western concepts on the Bible and defending the Bible as an errant in these kinds of things. Got it? Are you getting over the shock or are you getting even more shocked as I go along here? I don't know. How's, how's it going out there? Okay. All right. <laughs> Does Psalm 51.5 teach original sin? You know? It says, as far, in, in Psalms 103.12, it says, as far as the east is from the west. As if you could measure how far east is from the west anyway. You know what I'm saying? Is that an error? Or is he just saying, you know, <laughs> he's just saying as far as the east is from the west. The, the Bible describes the sun rising. Does the sun rise? No, it doesn't. The earth spins. The sun doesn't rise. The earth spins. So therefore, the Old Testament writers are mistaken. Therefore, you're mistaken every time you say, I want to see the sun rise. Okay? So again, we don't want to, uh, we don't want to, we don't want to force a Western concept of what it would mean to be an errant on the Old Testament. Okay? Is it possible that the writer of Genesis 1 was making principally theological points and not you know, paying absolute attention to the details of the order of everything that happened in blah, blah. Is that, I, I, I don't know. I believe God could have had given the right order. Is that, is that, are we going to make that stand on error or lack of error in the Bible? I'd say, let, let's just say, here's what I think. I'm pretty sure this is the case, but, you know, I don't know. Yeah. By the way, I believe there's a flood. I believe there are animals in the flood, and the Noah was in the flood, and I believe the flood affected the whole earth. That's, that's honestly what I believe. I believe there was a guy named Adam, there was a guy named Eve, and they, that God made them. A, a woman named, that's another deal there. Yeah, yeah. Adam and Eve, Adam and Steve, you know, sorry. Yeah, never mind. That's why she laughed right away. That's why she thought that was so funny. All right, good. You know, but... I, I'm going to be honest with you. If at the end of time God says, well, that was a metaphorical story about what happened, I wouldn't go, oh, man, I'm just going to go to hell instead. You know, you know, <laughs> you know let, let's, let's not stake our faith on things like this. Okay? I tend to take very conservative views, to be honest on this. I do it on purpose, actually. All right? But, you know, I don't really know. And I don't think it matters. Bottom line is inspiration is solid, but inerrancy should be defined carefully. Okay? That's, that's what I'll say about that. Okay, good. Chicago Statement. Uh, I don't have time. Just Google it sometime. It's, it's, it's excellent. The Chicago Statement on Inerrancy is excellent. It, it, they, they did a fantastic... I could not improve on it. I, can't, I, I haven't found anything yet in it I could improve on, to be honest with you. And they, they clearly say, for example, uh, inerrancy is not confined to the use of metaphor and the use of, of you know, hyperbole and, and, and that the Bible contains symbolic language and, and we should, you know, these kinds of things, okay? We further deny that, that inerrancy is neglected by biblical phenomena such as lack of modern technical precision. Am I in that one? Yes. Uh, irregularities of grammar, all right, might there be some bad grammar in the originals? There is bad grammar in the originals. There is. There is. There's bad grammar. No, not as bad as, as, as um, the Book of Mormon. That, that, that's way over the top. But there's, in quotes, bad grammar. There's, there's imperfect grammar. Revelation has some imperfect... You know, so does that mean the Bible's inerrant? It does, it's no longer inerrant. Okay, so there you go. I'm going to go on to the next topic. And I assume there will be questions. All right. I, now, now, I want to talk about Bible contradictions. I really want to get to history and archaeology, and it's already 440. All right. So I, I'm not going to spend much time on this. But I'll tell you this. 
Uh, I have a website. I've got a lot of questions. I'm sure I've gotten three, four, five thousand 5,000 questions by now. I've published 1,500 of them at my website. So I get a lot of questions. And the single biggest group is questions wondering whether the Bible could be in contradiction with itself. And uh, my simple answer is no. There are no contradictions in the Bible. There are none. All right, well, let's go on to the next thing. Well, let's, let me explain what I mean by that. All right. Um, now, a lot of us just don't want to listen to this, and you know, the, you know, you just need to have faith, and you just need to. Why are you asking these questions? Don't say this to young Christians. Don't ever do that. Don't rebuke them for having questions. Bad, bad, bad idea. Okay. Try to answer the questions, and if you can't answer the questions, say, "I don't know." Say, "I've been around long enough to know that there's going to be a good answer. I just don't know it." Or say, "Send an email to." John Oaks, he'll answer it for you. So instead of ignoring the question, I think we should think carefully. The Bible does say, Jesus did say we need to love the Lord our God with all our soul, mind, and strength, which means we have to think. Uh, we need to, to do our best to be prepared to answer. Don't be paranoid. You can't answer every question. There are hopefully experts around who can help you. But to the extent you can, amongst all the other things you do, try to become as expert as you can, especially if you're going to be working in the campus ministry, that's extra reason to become at least somewhat good at these things. Okay? Anyway, uh, Bible contradictions include identical events described by two different authors, which have details of fact that appear to contradict, claims that a doctrine which is taught in two different passages is in contradiction, numbers of objects, people, or years in two different passages. No, I mean, these are typical kind of things people say are contradictions. Let me give some examples. Uh, questions asked, is this a legitimate contradiction? In other words, is there a reasonable explanation other than it's a contradiction? We'll see that. I mean, uh, in, in one version it says that Jesus carried his cross, in another version, it says that, uh, that uh, whatever that guy, uh, you know, Simon of Cyrene carried the cross. Contradiction, right? Maybe. Or maybe Jesus carried the cross partway, and then Simon picked it up and carried it the rest. Now, if we're going to assume there's a contradiction, it's only fair. If you're going to tell somebody you're wrong, there's a contradiction, that's, that's only a reasonable thing if you can show that it is certainly a contradiction, and there's no reasonable alternative to that. We don't assume, that, that's the problem. People assume the Bible's totally wrong unless it's totally proved to be right in every single point. Any possible contradiction is a contradiction. Is there any chance that a scribal error could explain it? It's possible. Is it possible two passages rather than contradictions of one another actually complement one another? In other words, at first glance, they may seem to say something that contradicts, but actually they're saying two different things which, to, taken together, are, have a deeper meaning. All right, so um, let's see here. All right, contradictions of fact. Contradiction. Let me see. Do I have the explanations of these? Okay. All right, here we go. Uh, in 2 Samuel 8, 4, it says David took 700 men. In 1 Chronicles 18.4, it said he took 7,000 men. All right, so which is it, 700 or 7,000? Let's go back to our possible explanations. Oops, let me see. Our possible explanations would be um, it's a legitimate contradiction and there's no way to work it out, so one of them is just flat wrong. One possibility. Another possibility is there might have been a scribal error Another possibility is that maybe um, they complement one another. So there are two different battles or something like that. Which do you think it is? Scribal error. Scribal error. Right. Does that mean the Bible has errors? The answer is no, it doesn't. It, the original autographs are inerrant. All right. Um, here we go. Exodus 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath. By keeping it holy. Isaiah 1.13, your Sabbaths and convocations I cannot bear. So God said to keep the Sabbath, and then he said, I hate the Sabbath. Therefore, the Bible's contradictory, right? No. These, this is, I'm telling you, this is what I get. I get these kind of stuff. Uh, uh, let me see. Uh, let me, what about yeah, Genesis 7.17? Let me read that one. Oh, yeah. Uh, Genesis 7.17 said the flood lasted 40 days. Genesis 8.3 said the flood lasted 150 days. Obvious error. 
No. No, actually, Genesis 40 said the rain, Genesis, I'm sorry, Genesis 7, 17 said the rain lasted 40 days. And Genesis 8, 3 said the flood lasted for 150 days. Yeah. I was, I was in Kansas City in 1993. Wow. The rain had stopped weeks beforehand. The river kept coming up and up and up and up for like two or three weeks. Now, what about a global flood? How much longer would that keep rising? I don't know. It's not a contradiction. And then there's Genesis 36, 37, where it says, uh, let me see, let me, let me turn there just really fast. Genesis 37, 36. Genesis 37, 36. Here we go. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph into Egypt. The problem with that is that in Genesis 39, it says the Ishmaelites sold him into Egypt. Error! And I'm telling you, your, your Muslim friends will do, they, they, they just, they'll keep throwing these at you. If you answer 17 of them, they'll throw 26 more at you. All right, but trust me. All right, so which is it? Was he sold? Uh, uh, did, did the Midianites sell him down into Egypt or was it the Ishmaelites? Well, I have a question. Are you Missourian? Yes? Yes. No. Oh, well, okay. Who's from Missouri? <laughs> Are you Missourian? Yes. Are you American? Yes. This guy is crazy. <laughs> he claims he's both American and Missourian. Obviously, he's wrong and off his rocker. All right. Because it turns out the Midianites were Ishmaelites. That's your error? That's your contradiction? Okay. Um, uh, here's, here's a good one. Exodus 24 through 5. Let's read that. Exodus 24 through 5. Exodus 40, um, Exodus 20, 4 through 5. This, this is a hard one. There, there are a few claimed contradictions that are actually hard to explain. Let's say there's a thousand of these, and 950 of them are like, oh, <laughs> you know, easily explained. Just read the Bible, common sense. But then out of those thousand, there's 50 that are actually kind of interesting. That you might have to think carefully. Okay, Exodus 24 through 5. Here we go. Okay. Here we go. Um, I'll just read verse 5. You shall not bow to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of their fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Okay? Punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. Now let's go to Exodus, uh, uh, sorry, Ezekiel 18, 19 and 20. Ezekiel 18, 19 and 20. Yet you ask, why does the son not share the guilt of his father? Since the son has, not, has done what is just and right and has been careful to keep all my decrees, he will surely live. The soul of sins is the one who will die. The son will not share the guilt of the father, nor will the father share the guilt of the son. Now, it seems like before Ezekiel wrote Ezekiel 18, he should have consulted Exodus 20 and kind of make sure he didn't put a contradiction into the Bible. Now, you have to admit, now this one here, that, you know, it seems like they have a point. All right, so let me help you out there. Uh, Exodus 20 is talking about the physical results in this life. In this life, if you sin, you're not the only one who suffers. The bottom line is, if a man beats his wife, who suffers? The kids? Do the grandchildren suffer? Yeah, yeah. yeah about the great-grandchildren. Could be. Now, could God, could God come in and somebody could get saved and kind of break up? The bottom line is, you know what? It's like we didn't even need God to say Exodus 20, verse 4. We kind of knew it already, you know? When people sin, it brings suffering into the world, and that suffering is inherited as, through the generations. But that's not what the writer of Ezekiel is talking about. Ezekiel is talking about eternal. And in eternity... Exodus 18 is true. And uh, when you see the, the balance of Scripture, you always have to ask, 
Which is the fundamental truth? Which is the fundamental truth? Exodus 20 or Ezekiel 18? The answer is Ezekiel 18. Which is the fundamental truth? We're saved. We're not saved by faith except with works. You know, James 2. Or we're saved by uh, grace, not by works, in Ephesians 2. Which is the more fundamentally true? Ephesians 2 or James 2? Ephesians 2 is the more fundamental truth. Does it contradict James 2? It doesn't contradict it. James 2 explains it. Okay? So that's another example of contradictions. I'm going to summarize by saying there are none. Now, there's one, there's one in the Bible. You know, I, I think I got it right, but uh, how about Proverbs 26.4? There's a good one. Proverbs 26.4. <laughs> this is a funny one. Yeah. Proverbs 26.4. <laughs> I got you on this one. All right. Do not answer a fool according to his folly. Or you'll be like him yourself. Next verse. Answer a fool according to his folly. Or you'll be wise in his own eye. Help me out here. Which should I do? <laughs> of course, these are proverbs. These are not doctrines. There's some people who are so foolish that to even enter into the conversation would, be, would make you a fool as well. Just say nothing. There's some people who say something foolish. Just repeat what they just said. And they'll go, oh yeah, that was, that was foolish. Uh, so sometimes the best thing to do is, is to answer according to the folly. And I mean, Jesus did that. Paul did that. You know, he said, all right, those Galatians that want you to get circumcised, I say, let's take it the whole way and cut the whole thing off. You know, that's in Galatians. Yeah, wow, Galatians 3. I mean, you know, Paul clearly answered a fool according to his folly there, all right? At other times, I'm sure he didn't. All right? So there you go. Contradictions in the Bible. I'm going to conclude that there are none. Okay? Here's a, bunch, here's a list of, of several and, that you could explain. All right, great. Uh, the Bible has dozens of authors, yet it's miraculously consistent in its message and theme. The whole Bible is about Jesus. I mean, there's so many things that talk about. All right, great. Now, I've got one more presentation I want to... Mm, how am I doing? Five o'clock. Should we stop here with just questions? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, Let's take questions and see how it goes. Questions. If we get a uh, half hour of questions, we'll say good enough. Yes? On the Proverbs 26, four, uh, when, when Greg talks about that, he, he talks about it being a dichotomy or dichotomous statements. Uh, yeah. Like, intention with each other to demonstrate on purpose yeah. right and Greg being a very smart guy uses that big fancy word mm. <laughs> I like that so so what, what would you say like would you say that that's a you would agree with that I would say they're both true but in a different sense okay. which I think that's basically what Greg's saying yeah They're, in other words one is being used as you think about the one and you think about the other they, they, you know, they, they, they sort of fill out the meaning of the other. Yeah? What's the one that you haven't quite figured out? Well, I, I figured it out. Uh, it's the one, let me see. Um, he, he says, one says, take a staff. Jesus was giving them instructions. And in one set of instructions, he says, take a staff. And the other one, he says, don't take a staff. And I'm telling you, of the entire, I mean, I've gotten hundreds, whatever, zillions. That's the only one I have to find myself saying where, where the answer appears contrived. Okay? You see what I'm saying? In other words, all the other answers to the contradictions I've given, it, um, they were the obvious answer. To me, it's like that, that's more obvious even than the uh, assumption that it's a contradiction. But in, the, in that one, when I give the answer, I admit that my answer, although I believe it, I admit, if I, knew, if I had no possible even idea the Bible's inspired, I would say, that seems a little bit contrived. It's the only one where I, I, I believe it can be explained. And go to my website. And I explain that one at my website, okay? All right? But I, I admit, when I give that answer, it appears as if the answer was, 
was made with an underlying assumption motivating the answer rather than the actual thing itself. With every other contradiction I've ever seen in the Bible, claimed contradiction, I believe the answer I've given is, is clearly the better answer that any clear-minded person who understood the, the context, etc., I think reasonably would agree that it's better than saying, no, that looks like a, a, a contradiction. All right? Got it? Next. Um, on the resurrection of Jesus, I guess some people claim that there's a contradiction in, uh, I guess, where Jesus was first seen or... Uh, or who first saw him. Yeah. Can you address that? Um, that's, it's too complicated to address it right here because the, the answer is, is, is it's just too complex. Uh, I, I suggest you go to my website. Um, I guess probably just do a word search under maybe resurrection or something like that. And I, I've got the answer there. And even there, um, I believe what I did is I, I took some, something that somebody else wrote and it's basically um, a, a, a detailed account of what happened. First this, then this, then this, then this, then this, then this, then this, which is in agreement with everything said in all four Gospels. Okay? And um, again, bear in mind, if the accounts were all exactly the same, then why even have more than one account? And it would be evidence they'd colluded with one another. So the fact that the accounts have differences, I believe, gives us more reason to believe in the authenticity of the statements rather than less. Because basically they're evidence that we have independent witnesses. And if you have independent witnesses, that gives more, more believability or more confidence to the conclusion that it's what actually happened. I use the illustration from that trial that I was a juror on. Yes? Yeah. Well, you, you know, you can't solve everybody's problem in the first meeting, that's for sure. So, I mean, I just... You have to make decisions. I mean, you're in a particular situation. What should I do here? Should I just kind of figure, I'll just, you know, this person's clearly not open. Uh, I'm, I, I'm not going to pour my uh, pearl, throw my pearls before swine. Don't say that to them, though. Okay. And, and, and just go on to the next thing. Uh, you know, a lot of times, maybe just throw out a single comment and, and hope that it'll stick later on. It's something for them to think about, give them something to think about. Because um, he brought, like, he was prepared, but, like, yeah. like... What was he trying to argue? Well, um, I don't know if you remember Charles, yeah. but, like, in the Old Testament, he was like, um... <laughs> <laughs> he was like, um... Like, oh, God's supposed to be a loving God, but it was... Yeah, that's a great one. I'm going to do a whole talk. I'm going to do a lesson on that later on tomorrow. So it was just that basic yeah. what people usually who don't believe in God go to. Like, but in this case, God. he's giving, a, that's a really good question. Most of the stuff people say in the Bible is not accurate historically. The Bible's not accurate scientifically. You know, the Bible's full of contradictions. This is a bunch of, these, these are smoke screens or people that don't know what they're talking about. But the question about how could a loving God do some of the things that happened in the Old Testament? Yeah. Now, that's a good question. That's an excellent question that's hard to answer. Uh -huh. So here you give me an example of, and I think an, a question like that deserves an answer. Mm -hmm. I believe it deserves an answer. <clears throat> and if you can't answer that question, you need to go back and do some research. And you send that question over to me. Okay. I mean, I'm the answer man. Uh, you know, <laughs> um, if I've answered... I'm not saying that to be arrogant or prideful. I mean, I've answered literally thousands of questions. So if you're stuck, send it to me. Probably I already answered it. All right, I'm going to talk about why does God uh, allow people, you know, uh, the Jews to massacre people. That's that's a tough question. All right. You wrote that book, Pain and Suffering. No, no, I didn't write a book on that. I wrote an article on that. I, I te we have a class on that in our apologetic. We, one of the classes in our apologetic certificate is called Answering the Hard Questions. Okay, and I'm going to talk about that briefly here tomorrow if I get to it. I hope I do. 
And, uh, and the hard questions are, why is there hell? Yeah. Why is there suffering? Why is there evil? Why is there slavery in the Old Testament? And why is there violence committed by God's people in the Old Testament? And then the sixth one is, what about the Trinity? <laughs> Those are the six that I list as the hard questions. I, I think... The nice thing about those is when you answer those questions, you're going to deepen your faith. You're going to understand God better because those are theological questions. All the hard questions are theological ones. They're not evidential ones. They're theological ones. Yeah. The, 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 you know, the Bible's full of science errors. No, it's not. <laughs> There's none. <laughs> Give me one. There are none. The Bible has all these historical errors. No, it's not. There's not a single one. Okay, the, uh, the, you know, why is, uh, why is God allowing uh, violence to occur in the Old Testament? And, and in fact, he's ordering his people to do it. Now, that's a good question. That's a really hard question. All right. Yeah, uh, should I answer it right now? I, you know, I, I just want to make sure I got the big picture of this. Okay. So, basically, you're saying that the Bible is inerrant because of the original... But I'm saying the autographs, the autographs, fancy word, the autographs are inerrant and inspired. But translations are... Not inspired. Have, not inspired. They could have errors. And, yes. And so that's the point of... The that's not the only point that I made, but that's one of the points I made. That's not the main point. I don't think so. The main, the main point is not the but. The main point is not the buts. The main point is the statement, which is the Bible is inspired by God. Okay. And it's inerrant. It's perfect. Without error, it is God's word to us through people. Okay? Now, in explaining that, especially the question of inerrant, mm -hmm. we have to be careful how, what, how we explain that. That means without error. Right. So. Right, but what about when this guy said, we know that God does not listen to sinners? Yeah. All right? What about the possibility that uh, somebody rounded off, somebody said there were 5,000 killed, but it turns out it was actually 5,106? Oh. So there are answers for it. What, what if somebody rounded something off? So what I'm saying is we need to define inerrancy carefully so we don't paint ourselves into a corner. Okay. okay, we need to have a nuance carefully defined and described. And I would say, just, just Google Chicago statement on inerrancy, and you'll see what I believe is a really great, they do a really great job there, of saying, this is true, but bear this in mind. This is true, but bear that in mind. And, and if you are going to take a stand about this, you're probably going to be in trouble. It's because hmm, you will be in trouble. But the, the thing that's encouraging to me is at the end of the day, it's inspired and inerrant. I mean, I, I've, I feel, I mean, I've been in this game for a long time, and I, I, I'm not even slightly worried about it, to be honest with you. Because when, I, when I've looked into these questions at the end, every time this, this happens, I find myself more confident than ever because I look at their arguments and I go, seriously? Now, there are exceptions. I don't say seriously to that one. I don't say it because that's a good question. That's an excellent question. Yeah? So, uh, my question is in regards to the Hebrew writing. Yeah. So, you, there are no Hebrew ancient texts, is what you're saying? Dead Sea Scrolls, yeah. Oh, but no other than the Dead Sea Scrolls. Well, that's... That, that's the, the Dead Sea Scrolls include at least fragments of every book in the Old Testament except Esther and like two or three others. So of the 39 books of the Old Testament that we have, all but three or four are found either in completely or in fragment in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So with that, so like in learning Hebrew or yeah. learning the Hebrew Bible, is that the same Hebrew of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Essentially, yes. Okay. Now, again, uh, wh when the Dead Sea Scrolls were published, uh, the, like RSV, one of the RSV or NAS, I can remember, they made something like four changes in Isaiah. 
and I don't know what they are, but it, for all, it might have been six changes. I can't remember. Of those four or six changes, you kind of look, those there's this like insignificant. Mm -hmm. Insignificant. He right, uh, uh, did this for that instead of he did this because of that, or you know, stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, uh, like I said, the Greek New Testament, not that you can read Greek, but if you could, the Greek New Testament is virtually exactly the same as the, as the autographs. Okay. The Hebrew Old Testament is a reasonably close representative of the original autographs. Okay? I, I don't want to say stronger than the evidence points towards. I, I'm, I'm sure there are quite a few, especially with numbers and stuff and, and spellings of names and things like that. I'm sure there's a lot of those errors if you want, in, the, in the copies. And there's probably, you know, maybe whole lines that were lost. I don't know. I mean, I, I can't say. But I would say this. The, the, the doctrines of Christianity, uh, the theology about God, uh, you know, what's right and wrong, these things are not in doubt at all. Okay? Yeah? Um, long time ago, I was told that Greek was sort of the international language of the day, and it was very accurate, and each word had its own very specific meaning. Yeah. Therefore, when the New Testament was provided, it was provided at a time that the language was very accurate and very uh, exact. Is yeah. That right? Is that right? Yeah. That. Thank you for that softball question. <laughs> I like that kind. I. Um, yes. I agree with that. Yeah. Um, uh, especially in the use of verbs. Uh, but see, English is a, not a very precise language. English is a great language because we have such a huge vocabulary. The the greatest advantage of English is our huge vocabulary. Uh, but uh, Greeks. The Greek language was ridiculously precise because every noun had 10 different endings. And the, ver the number of endings for verbs, I, I, it goes on and on and on. They had, they had so many tenses. They could express such incredible subtleties that we can't even begin to express in English. So the fact that it was a lingua franca of this whole area of the world, I, mean, I see that as God's providence. You know, at just the right time, it says that in the Bible, at just the right time. At just the right time, in just the right place, in just the right circumstances, the Pax Romana, and the Greek language, and the, the actual physical location, and so many other things. God chose the perfect place, time, and language, and historical setting to send the Messiah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, okay, you had made a comment earlier, um, and I, you might have already explained it, but you had said that you, you don't think creationism should be uh, well, first of all, I'm a creationist. Of course, all Christians are creationists. Okay? And, uh, but uh, creation is a religious topic, not a scientific topic. So I don't think creation belongs per se in science classes. Now, I teach science, I teach chemistry, I teach physics. And I bring the idea of, con of creation into my classes all the time. But I don't do a unit on it. Because I, I, mean, I, I can't do an experiment on creation. I mean, it's kind of hard to do that. All right. So, you know, so creation is a topic that I believe should be reserved principally to philosophy classes and religion classes, not science classes. Uh, not that uh, science teachers cannot refer to it and mention evidence for it and and, and, but I'm saying, I'm not going to do a unit in my, I'm, I, what, what, what experiment am I going to do? Where am I going to put in the class? Is it going to be in the thermodynamics section? Is it going to be in the chemical reaction section? It, it doesn't really belong in the, in the curricular content in a science class. All right, because creation, by definition, is supernatural, not natural. So if we talk about the natural things in science classes. All right, so that's, that's part of what I meant. The other part of what I meant is, uh, you know, uh, you we'll know, talk about the age of the earth. That's going to be in tomorrow's topic. I'll bring it up now, though. All right. Uh, now, um, I, what's clear, the scientific evidence points towards the universe being old, okay? It, it just does. Uh, it's, it points towards both the earth being old and the universe being old. 
And that's the only direction the scientific evidence points. It doesn't point in another direction. It certainly doesn't point towards saying the Earth is 6,000 years old. So if you're going to introduce a branch of, in your science class of science defending the Earth is a few thousand years old, uh, please don't do that. All right? Because, first of all, there is none. <laughs> you know, so, uh, you know. Um, now, let me, let me tell you this. Here's, I don't, I don't, in my chemistry and physics classes, this doesn't come up. It, it would have to come up on some level in biology, but it's really not that relevant in chemistry anyway. I do talk about the age of the Earth. I have this class, Science 110. It's Intro to Scientific Thought, and there I talk about the age of the Earth and the age of the universe. I talk about it quite a bit, actually. And what I do is at some point, because I, I teach in East County, San Diego, there, these, this is like the, the right wing Christian groups, they're, they're, you know, the, the total fundamentalist types. And I believe I need to be respectful to them as to the atheists and the Muslims and everything else in my class. So what I do is I say, now uh, let me talk about the age of the earth for a minute. All right, now I'm, I'm going to just tell you right now, from the, 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 the uranium dating and the, 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 the Big Bang measurements, blah, 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 the universe appears to be about 13 and a half billion years old. The Earth appears to be around 4 and a half billion years old. And that's, that's the evidence. It does, you know, there's many lines of evidence. They all point to the same thing. So the scientific conclusion is that, according to the evidence, they appear to be that age. Okay. Now, let me talk about the, the young Earth idea. So what I'm going to do is, I, and I do this in class. I literally do this. I said, I'm going to walk over there for a minute. And I'm going to speak not as a scientist, but as a theologian. So I literally do this. All right, all right, great. Now let's talk about theology. Let's not talk about science for now. Let's talk about theology for a minute. All right, good. Now, um, let, let's just assume for a moment, for the sake of argument, that an omnipotent, omniscient, omni, all those other things, God exists. Could that God create an earth that appeared old when he created that earth? And could that God create a universe that appeared old when he created it? And everybody has to say yes. I mean, what else can they They have to say yes. Okay, good. Now that we're done with that, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Now let's talk about the science. Now, if God created the earth appearing old, then when you looked at it, it would appear old. old. All right, great. Now, one, we, one thing we know for sure is it appears old. All right. So why would these people try to defend scientifically that the earth appears young and that dinosaurs live 5,000 years? Come on. Please. Please, don't do that. It, it just makes Christianity look so silly. These people aren't scientists. They're not. They're not. So, uh, that would be my uh, response to that. Uh, and there's a, there's a few things that I think are worth throwing out there. For example, Let's say you look through a telescope at a galaxy that's 4 billion light years away. Let's just say that you do. Okay, then when did the light leave that galaxy that's hitting your eye through the telescope? 4 billion years, Four billion years ago. Now, if the universe is only 10,000 years old, I have a question. Is that galaxy even there? Ooh, got him, baby. And if so, uh, because... Obviously, God put the light kind of in path. And God could do that. I mean, God could do whatever he wants. You know, he put the coin in the fish, and, you know, he, he, he walked on the water. He, made the, he turned water into wine. And, and, and it says in the Bible that if God wanted to turn these stones into children of Abraham, he could. And I believe it. That's not the question. The question is, is that what he did? I don't know. But that would be kind of strange, you know. And put it this way, if the earth is only a few thousand years old, one thing I know for sure is dinosaurs definitely did not live, and I did try the they didn't. Because if they'd lived at all, then it was a very long time ago. But might God have put dinosaur bones in the ground? Could God have conceived of an earth that had existed for four and a half billion years, but he didn't want to wait, I guess, so he created the earth that had the appearance of that? Of course he could. Did he? I doubt it. But the point is, if you take that position, that's a theological position. It's a 100% theological position. It's not like sort of a little bit science and a little bit of theology. It's all theology. And I say, amen. I, I have no argument with that. I mean, amen. I mean, maybe that is what happened. How do I know? How does anybody know? I, I honestly don't know. So I, I hope, hopefully I'm humble enough to admit I don't know. But if you ask my opinion... If you ask my opinion, I don't agree with that opinion. That's, that's not my opinion. 
I, it's not the God that I know to do that kind of stuff, that kind of trick us like that, but how, how am I to know? So that's why creationism, at young earth creationism, should definitely not be you know, you know, shoehorned into our science curriculum. Another thing is design. You know, there's the, 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 the whole design thing and, and um, you know, the, that, that, that aspect. And again, uh, I, I believe in design. I'm going to talk about that tomorrow. The, that the universe is designed is, is as obvious as it is that you and I are sitting right here. You know what I'm saying? But design is not a scientific hypothesis. It's not. It's not a scientific hypothesis for two reasons. Number one, you can't test it. And number two, you can't falsify it. You can't prove that something wasn't designed. And you can't prove that it was designed. Therefore, by definition, the intelligent design argument is not a scientific one. Therefore, it should not be included as curriculum in science classes. Should it be mentioned in science classes? Absolutely. I do it all the time. <laughs> but we, we wouldn't have a chapter on design because it, that's not a scientific idea. Okay? So I believe in creation. I'm a creationist. I believe in intelligent design. But I, don't, I wouldn't appreciate these people trying to uh, shoehorn either of those concepts into a biology class or a chemistry class or a physics class. Don't belong there. Now, in my Science 110 class, it's there. I teach about science and religion, you know. I, 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 I wrote the textbook for my class and I have this essay where I strongly defend that both science and religion are true and, and that working together, everybody's better off. I'm not going to apologize for that, but I wouldn't put that chapter in a chemistry textbook. Anyway, end of sermon. And we used up our time almost till 5.30, so we're definitely not going to start the next section, but I'll take 10 more minutes worth of questions. Unless you want, I'll go till 8 o'clock if you want, but, you know. All right. So, what this means is I'm going to have to talk even faster tomorrow. Unless I do the stuff about archaeology. Oh, that, oh, I love that stuff about archaeology. It's so awesome. So, John, I have a question. Yeah. Um, and I might have been, I was in and out, but I might have missed this part. So, you were talking about the current versions of the Bible we have now, and they're not inspired, right? The um, translations are not inspired. I like to be really, really careful how I say this stuff. You get yourself in trouble really fast. So, I'd say the translations are, obviously, we all know they're not inspired, because if they're inspired, they'd all be exactly the same, right? Right, so they're, so they're not inspired. Yeah, go ahead. Well, that was my question. How do we know that we're not, that they're not inspired? I mean, because if they're inspired, they'd all be exactly the same. Yeah. No. And they're not all exactly the same. So, therefore, almost by definition. But what, what reason would there be? Why, why would you think, for example, let's say... First of all, you mean a committee is inspired, right? Not a person, a committee. So this committee sits down to make, I don't know, the New English Bible. You're saying that committee is inspired? What, what, would be your, what would be your evidence that they're inspired? What would be your reason to argue they would be inspired? Does God inspire such things? Right? So you're saying because we can't prove that they're inspired, they're not inspired. But they're not ins I mean, uh, if they were inspired, then if you had three different definitions. So which one's inspired then? Let, let's just pick one randomly. No, well, let's say the NIV is inspired. NIV is inspired. Well, then obviously the RSV was just, you know. The, so you're saying, so how'd you pick that one? I did. They, all right, that's, there you go. <laughs> Answer, your question answered. I mean, they're paraphrased. You have an inspired paraphrase, you know? You know? No, they're not inspired. Do you believe that, that books written by men now can be inspired? No, I, I, which book? I mean... I don't know. I'm just asking, if, can men now be carried along by the Holy Spirit to write um, I don't believe so, but God could do whatever he wants. If God wanted to inspire somebody over there to write something, amen for that. Now, we're not going to incorporate it into the Bible for obvious reasons. I mean, God can do whatever he wants to do. Could God make somebody speak in tongues? Absolutely. Does he do it? I don't know. I don't want to be so arrogant to say that he never does that. 
I don't think he does that, but what's my opinion matter for anything? God can do whatever he wants. What I'm just saying is the, the Bible is complete. We're not going to be adding more books to it. And I believe that that is not a mode that God uses normally today, and I can give you about six reasons, but then I'm just using logic. Logic says, you know, when, when the, when the um, you know, it says in, in Zechariah that after a certain time, those who say they're a prophet, there's no prophecy anymore. It says that in Zechariah 11. It seems to imply that. It says, in fact, if you claim to be a prophet, you're going to be killed and all this kind of stuff. There's plenty of evidence that says the Bible is complete. All right? And, and uh, God, you know, God gave inspired instruction because they needed it. We don't need it anymore. What do we need that we don't have? I, you know, it's complete. Uh, 2 Timothy 3. It's uh, you know, for every good work. So, if, if God does it, so what? I mean, that, that's like, you know, what about if there's people in other galaxies? I, you know, what about it? You know, what about, what if God healed this person over here? Amen. Good for him. I, you know, I, what, what am I supposed to say about that? You know, God could do whatever he wants. Um, but I would say, what, 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 what can we reasonably expect that God's going to do right now? And I don't think we can reasonably expect he's going to inspire any new books, to be honest with you. All right, yeah. Okay, so in regards to the different translations, um, uh, you said that the original manuscripts, the original autographs, are what is inspired. And when explaining to someone, a like, college-age student, I can imagine that someone might argue that um, which translation do we trust then, since they... The answer is we trust God only, not a translation. Right, but we have... Like, we personally have translations. So do you suggest that we have multiple ones to offer to the person? So that way we... Like, I mean, most them. people couldn't care less about any of this. But if you have somebody who cares a lot about this, then please have several translations. There are people, when I study the Bible, I purposely bring two or three translations in with me. That's probably less than one out of ten that I studied the Bible with. But if you have somebody for whom this is an issue, then just take that issue away. And I'm telling you, bring... A Greek interlinear. You know, if you don't have one, buy one. You can get one online for probably less than $20. I know for you that's probably a lot of money, but and fine, borrow it from somebody. <laughs> All right? Most people don't care about this, but if they do, do your best to... to so, yes. And, and just as a rule, when we're, when we're having our Bible talks, don't make people just use the NIV. It, welcome others. In fact, uh, what I often do is say, could, some, could I have another translation? I say, could I have another translation? Could I have a th fourth one? We kind of, all right, let, let's think about all, uh, considering all four of those, what do you think this verse actually means? That's, that's a good idea. Why not? Now, I don't know, maybe in a campus setting, maybe that'd be confusing. If, all right, fine, then don't do it. Whatever is going to work in that setting, do it. But I would say this, if you want to know what the original meant, I would claim, I already said it earlier, I'm going to say it again. If you have... All these different translations, the good ones, take them together, kind of find the average of the meaning, all those four things, plus all these other tools about the historical context and all this kind of stuff. I believe you have as good an access to the original meaning as the person to whom it is written. And I, I'm, not, I'm not kidding. I think in some cases we have better access to the original meaning even than the original hearers because of the other things we have access to. Imagine you're reading the Bible in the Middle Ages. Oh my goodness gracious. I mean, hello. I mean, we have so much material. So we can be extremely confident that we can un uh, you know, uncover the original meaning to the extent far beyond what's necessary for anybody to go to heaven, never mind to answer any important question. Right, people who speak uh, a ta a Tajik or something like that. They probably only have one translation. It was, probably was done in 1846, you know. Those people, now they, they, should, they, they should maybe have some concerns, but not us, who have, I don't know how many translations. And most of them are excellent. Virtually all of them are excellent. Okay, yeah. Have you ever found, from all the different translations one where the overall message of that Bible is inerrant. No, like, no. What do you mean overall message? Like, you said, like, 
the whole reason behind the Bible and everything else is, you know, God, God Jesus, it's all about Jesus, you know, like the self right. salvation. If you take a book out of the Bible, it doesn't really matter. You still get that plan. Yeah. Is there any translation? Let, let's please, do, do us a favor, please. Let's stop getting hung up over translations. Okay? I believe that as an English person reading the Bible, we have unlimited access to the understanding of the original writers. I mean, we have commentaries, we have dictionaries, and so, I mean, this should be a non-issue to us. Well, I think what he's, I think, if I may say, I think maybe what he's asking is, is, in your humble opinion, what is the absolute worst or, you know, bad, what's the worst translation out there? The, the worst translation is the one that you use without using any others. Okay? Because there's no, there's no best translation. There is no best translation. There's only translations that might handle a particular passage better than another. There's no best translation. Now, there are worse translations. I mean, uh, the King James is questionable, not because of the original committee for several reasons. Uh, the New World Translation, don't even go there. Um, there's a cup, there's some paraphrases that are, there's some paraphrases that are, but there's some paraphrases that are useful, other paraphrases you probably should stay away from. Uh, I would say, use paraphrases with caution, always use a paraphrase along with a good either word for word or phrase for phrase. All right, and, and so uh, don't use paraphrases alone. I think paraphrases can be helpful. I, personally, I never use them ever, to be honest with you, but I think they can be useful. I know some people will find them useful. I don't, tr I don't get into arguments with them about it. But a paraphrase alone, that would not be, the, that would not be ideal. Yeah, I, I was just, it was more of kind of like a comment that we shouldn't get hung up on any of it because it's not about getting that detail in the Bible. That's true. I mean, generally, such minor things generally are not that essential anyway. Every once in a while, there's a legitimate concern about one word here and there, but that's quite, quite, quite rare in terms of, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm see this thing here. Should I walk into that building and do something in there? I, I don't think, you know, matters of interpretation are important there. You know, um, you know, is it necessary to repent to become a Christian? I don't think we have to worry about whether we have inspired translations on that. You know what I'm saying? What's the meaning of repent in the original language? You know, uh, you know I, I think the, the way to figure that out, you could read a dictionary and read all the scholars or just read 17 translations. You know, that, that'll do it. You don't need to know Greek or Hebrew. You do not need to know them. You, you gain very, if you were an amazing expert in both Hebrew and Greek, you would have only a very, very, very slight advantage over somebody who knows none at all. Hmm. Oh, that's good to hear. Right. <laughs> I'm, no, I'm serious. Seriously. Beca because we, can, we have the things written by these people. All right, now it is 5.30, so now we're going to say good enough. Question, does everyone know where this stands tonight? Anyone not know? Okay, great. Excellent. Okay, so here's the plan tomorrow morning. Um, what time do you want to start? The earlier the better for me, but okay. these are college students, some of them, so, you know, <laughs> seven in the morning is not going to work for them. Okay. It will work for me. Okay. Okay. Let's do this. Let's do breakfast. What time is breakfast? What time do you do breakfast? Uh, we can eat 7.30. 7.30? Okay, we're going to say breakfast starts at 7.30? 8 o'clock. All right, let's say breakfast from, uh, we'll say breakfast from 8 to 8.30. And then I will come up and we'll sing a couple of songs, say a prayer. And we'll make sure that uh, John can start at 9 because he needs to wrap up here around 3, 3.30 and hit the road. And obviously has a ton of material that he wants to cover tomorrow. But we have been blessed. Lots of great questions, guys.
you know, I appreciate John taking the time explaining everything to us. Uh, excellent stuff. If you got more questions, you know, maybe you don't want to watch the football game tonight. Maybe you just want to sit, yeah. right. you know, read up on all this stuff. Or the whole thing was watch the game. Great to have you all here. We'll see you tomorrow morning. Good evening, Mr. Brett. Well, let's close out with prayer. God, we have a great for the prayer. All that we've been able to learn and experience today, I uh, really got to thank you so much. I feel like uh, we not only were able to hear uh, just uh, some incredible uh, knowledge, God, but uh, I thought we were just get some, you know, faith feel to get fired. And, and, uh, I really feel, God, like you, you know, just uh, it's interesting uh, watching John teach him and teach him. We feel like, God, we got to know his heart a little bit. Mm-hmm. better as well. So thank you so much, uh, Father, for what we've learned. Mm-hmm. Uh, God, thank you so much that your word is perfect, and God, that, um, you know, there, there is, uh, there certainly is a little, some tension in the Bible. We thank you for that, God. We thank you, uh, Father, just as we are just uh, trying to learn and grow, and God, maybe struggle. God, there are lots of questions. I appreciate that God's put so much time in men like him, and put so much time in understanding you, God, so if you fill me, Father, with the a little extra of your spirit, God, for the purpose of being able to teach us. And I pray that we will stay attentive, God, for we get some rest tonight.